then tell me what would you like contrast and i think you've spoken a bit about about it contrast the traditional lending partners in the west and especially even looking at the future and what china is planning to do uh how can you contrast them and also uh what mechanisms can african governments employ you know to achieve debt yeah. sustainability you know like the whole thing that we are saying like yeah. what is it that african uh governments can do having observed all these things that they are not learning the west is not teaching and neither is china teaching what should be done but what can africa itself you know like do for its own self to like deal with some of these issues that you've identified i think the ingredients are there you know ingredients are there they just need to be put in the pot and at at the right time and given giving them the right measure so if you look at what has always been what has always been working because like as i said these the traditional lending partners in the west the developing countries the multilateral development banks the imf the world bank they do have all these initiatives they have the highly indebted poor countries initiative that they introduced when countries were going into debt in the early 2000s and the, the, they have that protocol for um the OCED and the IMF has debt sustainability programs and initiatives and it has a system where it shows how much countries owe and what they should do in case they reach the point where they cannot sustain the debt and they need to restructure so they have all these guidelines and then you have institutions like the Paris club you know it has had experience with lending and countries not being able to give money in this situation so it will have a protocol where it says that since we are all owing various amounts of money that's come together it's like a collective action mechanism they'll come together and they'll decide that you know this is the amount of money we should all request for and let's give this country this kind of time in order to be able to pay each of us and all the debtors i mean the creditors agree on those terms and they go forward with that so that has worked out for them for the west in the past because it's a collective action it's multilateralism there are many people bringing together collective political will so that gives kind of like legitimacy it gives pressure it puts african countries data countries in the open it makes them know that they these are the terms but most processes are protracted they take a long time to be able to get all these creditors to agree to these terms so in that term these african countries are still in limbo they are still in debt distress they are economies are collapsing on themselves they do not have the finances because during that time creditors have the power to veto a debtor going into the global capital market and looking for more money they can stop these countries they can lower credit ratings and that is why african countries are usually really very apprehensive about joining these highly indebted poor countries initiatives because as soon as you admit that you're in debt or you cannot reach the benchmark you are you have like a black mark on you in the private capital market you cannot access funds which happened for kenya you know in the initiative that the this covid-19 when kenya had that problem of meeting the commitment it you know for some of the loans it took out it did not want to register on to the debt service sustainable um, su- suspension initiative that the G20 reached to help indebted countries to be able to suspend that it's because it would put a black mark on you it would make you not attractive to other you know financiers countries cannot accept that they are in debt that they need because then you you cannot get more money 
So it puts you in this limbo state. You're always waiting for the other shoot to drop, you know, and to be forgiven. So these processes take a long time. You know, creditors are always holding out, especially for these collective action mechanisms. Creditors are always holding out for that good deal, that sweet deal that I will get maximum payback for the money that I got especially in competition with other creditors, whether I'll be paid first or we can bargain for this amount of money. So usually it's like that. Collective action is like that. And these days, especially with a lot of, you know, civil society and all these organizations, especially now with COVID-19, they're trying to break down that time and give governments the space to be able to handle the crisis, the COVID crisis, so they will say we will suspend, we will not negotiate, we'll just not talk about the debt you have for this time. But in the usual state of things, that's not how it happens. So you will find that it will take six years to be able to lift a veto on a country. So that is where China comes in and says, yeah, I'm not joining this multilateral thing that you guys, IMF has, G20 has, I'm not bargaining under your umbrella. I'll, I'll set my own terms. I'll either give countries this reduced to no interest, but still I'm not forgiving your loan. You know, that is the, the conundrum we are at because China does not want to join the collective multilateral system that has been going on. So there is that kind of friction between the old world and the new world it alone with these deals. So what African countries then have to do in this situation is either to go with the flow, whether I'll go with, you know, China and stick with China or I'll go with, you know, with the IMF and World Bank and stick to that, stick it out. It depends on what countries choose and to commit to that choice and to make sure that that choice, they can pay for that choice. So either way, you're going to have to in develop your bargaining power, your negotiation power. You're going to have to go to this table because obviously when the time comes when you're in debt distress and you're approaching your creditor, that time, I cannot pay you back. There's option to renegotiate and to restructure and to change terms. So what are African governments doing during that time? Because it sets the pace for how you're going to continue sustaining this debt. So you go there when you're planning to be transparent about how you got into this situation, how you can do it better, what is going to happen. So governments are going to have to start reassessing the projects they signed up on, which is happening in, in Egypt, with their port, they had a port that they had signed on with China. So they are reassessing the viability of that port and seeing whether they can actually maintain it within the final, you know, brackets they have. It's happening with Ethiopia, it's happening with uh, Zambia. So governments have to renegotiate and see where they are at and see if they can realistically meet these conditions. And then when you've reassessed the viability of the projects and spread it within, you know, looking at the money you want to have and the money you have to pay back, then you have to look at other alternatives. Because in the first place, you failed the whole finance, this whole financial system has failed. So you're going to look at other alternatives because they do give alternatives. The World Bank IMF is giving grants China gives grants under FOCAC. It does give grants. Of course, they are targeted to certain, to meet certain things, but at least you're getting money through those means that is not at an interest rate. It's it's not, doesn't have conditions of, you know, like loan, a loan. So you're going to have to look at grants. You're going to have to look at, at other options of finding money, development assistance, and then requesting that from your creditor. And then they are going to have to start monitoring activity. 
monitoring how these projects are handled, how they are managed, how they can be integrated within the socioeconomic structure of this government itself. What are you going to, how are you going to benefit from it? Are you going to go through, encourage through your uh, laws for Chinese companies to integrate, to have linkages, to enter into joint ventures, to buy some of the products that you need from the country? Are you going to enter into technological transfer, skills transfer? What are you getting from it in the long run? So you, they need to assess themselves and then they also need to assess the loans they are getting, you know, the, the, the loan structure itself to have a standard and to have a protocol within those loan agreements of what happens in case we default. So you're finding that in some countries, I think in Tanzania and also in, like in the EU, most in the EU structure, you have warnings, early warning systems when countries are reporting their annual budgets and their annual spendings. And there's, you know, they, there comes a ping when, you know, you're over the, your excess and then protocols start being engaged and you're cut off from borrowing anymore. And then you're going to, African governments are going to have to learn how to engage with their creditors, how to bargain for, in case, now like China that is saying, we're not going to forgive your debt altogether, you have to pay us back. You're saying, maybe let's start an initiative where this project pays itself. If you're looking at um, I read um, in an article by the China Africa Institute where like now like in Ghana or in, in Kenya, you're paying, the project pays the loan and there's a third party to handle this payment. So whatever comes, whatever revenues come out of this project are put within a certain account and then that count, account is used on a certain project. It doesn't go back to the creditor. It is disbursed within, you know, the economy. Either it's serving, you know, climate change objective, it's servicing poverty alleviation by creating jobs. It is servicing, you know, education. It is servicing coming up with mechanisms of dealing with COVID-19 and building health response and, and institutions it is doing something, you know, it is at a level where the country is not paying back. It's not, there's no money to pay back. You're just paying back by the money flows into the system. So I think those are some of the mechanisms you can look at. And also, if it does come down to really having to go into disparate resolution mechanisms, then we have to train our governments or give them options for legal help. You know, the African Development Bank has facilities for giving governments advice on how to protect themselves, especially against vulture funds or vulture creditors, those creditors that just buy countries' debts and then really hounds them to pay them back. So those are some of the mechanisms that African governments can use. So I think they can be used in a really in a ways that can make a difference. Have risk assessment, they'll assess the amount of risk they're going to get and then try to mitigate that within the interest rates or the periods, they spread it out within the periods they're going to, how they're going to get that money back. So they'll do risk assessment. And I think that is something that African governments need to do. They need to assess risk and put up uh, scenarios like to have scenarios in which they cannot pay back and what they'll do within those scenarios in case they cannot pay back. So they need to build up those mechanisms. And I think one other thing that I missed, which is really important, is probably transparency and accountability. Like that is just, I don't even know how I missed it out, but that is really critical because transparency and accountability helps you predict, to have predictability and to set up a system that can help you respond to debt distress circumstances. 
So if you're transparent about the loan agreement, it sets a kind of like a pattern. You know what happens, what the project, this kind of project needs. So you can be able to plan procurement, you can open up competition, um, you can know how companies compete, you can know what amount is used in technology, or you can you can spread out so many things and get all these indicators and be able to calculate what you're going to and what how you're going to maintain this debt. And also with account with, with accountability and also with with just participation because you're engaging the public in this project. Yeah. If it's out there in the public, the media, civil society can analyze, criticize, and give opinions. Mm. And they can inform the public on how funds and resources are being used. Mm. And it can explain to them and own these projects. Because secrecy distances communities away from projects. You find that people don't know how to use these projects. They won't know what that power plant is for how am i getting how am i benefiting from it why is it going how is it going to benefit my community how is this going to benefit my business so you have you have the problem of all these conspiracy theories coming up and it disrupts investment you know like china is bringing money yes it's helping our economy you know, it's, it's giving us the stimulus that we need to achieve economic development through these projects. But shrouding it in secrecy does not help the Chinese. It does not put them in a good light. They need to endear themselves to the public in order to have a acceptance and ownership of these developments. Mm. Yeah, we need to know that it benefits us. Yeah, and I think that's a very good observation. I think, Patricia, we will end at that note. But I will I will say that yes. I've seen, uh, like, on the media, on the Kenyan media, like, China saying that they want to, like, be portrayed better in the media. Uh, so maybe they have been listening, and now they think that they, they need to almost have the people, the society, the media portray them in good light. Because I think that's the other, the other issue is that, especially on the China side, other than the what you said, transparency and all, is that when Chinese companies come to Africa, and we can have this discussion much further at some point, they are not known to do the best things in, on the environment, on how they treat African workers, on respect for labor and employment rights. So I think that image by itself and even like where they go set up their business, they are known themselves to be corrupt, you know, like when they come to Africa and such things. So I think their image is not looking too good. And so it does not help even to start having this, these discussions about like debt trap. They already, you already have an image that's suffering. So it's not, unlike, you know, like there's no, it's very rare that you hear a US company came and set up in Africa. And the only thing they are known for is, like uh, the damage they have done to the environment because of their diet. It's 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 only in, for like Chinese people when they set up in this uh, in, in African countries that you hear that there's there are not even worries about the wildlife in the area. So it's quite it's quite something a lot that someone has to contend with when it comes to like the whole issue of China. But Patricia, I greatly appreciate what you've shared, and I think like most of the things that you've said, if even a policymaker was listening to them. It should be able to like guide at least in the negotiation process yeah. and to get like better agreements put in place uh, by African countries. But I think the whole point to take from this discussion is that Africa cannot, you know, like fold its hands and say that we are being taken advantage of. You, you are allowing yourselves to be yeah. taken advantage of, and in fact, you're facilitating yourselves to be taken advantage of. It's almost like you're you're in this yeah. dance together. Don't even act like oh, what just happened, yeah. you know, China did this to us. You're allowing yeah. yourself, you're dancing to their music and you're doing it very happily and gladly because now you can take the money and go do strange political things, especially in, in, in election years. Like, the, you know, like that's when all the boring happens and strange things happen. Anyway, uh, Patricia, thanks so much for coming on today. And we will do this again uh, next month. So guys, do let let us have your comments on these discussions and let us know uh, what 
we could discuss a bit more, you know, as an area of interest. Thanks a lot, everyone.